Hi guys, today is our last Coraline read aloud. Today we're going to be reading pages 102 to 160. So we're going to start with chapter 9. And here's the picture for that. It says, Outside, the world had become a formless, swirling mist with no shapes or shadows behind it, while the house itself seemed to have twisted and stretched. It seemed to Coraline that it was crouching and staring down at her, as if it were not really a house, but only the idea of a house. And the person who had had that idea, she was certain, was not a good person. There was sticky web stuff clinging to her arm, and she wiped it off as best as she could. The gray windows of the house slanted at strange angles. The other mother was waiting for her, standing on the, on the grass with her arms folded. Her black button eyes were expressionless, but her lips were pressed tightly together in a cold fury. When she saw Coraline, she reached out one long white hand, and she crooked a finger. Coraline walked toward her. The other mother said nothing. I got two, said Coraline. One soul still to go. The expression on the other mother's face did not change. She might not have heard what Coraline said. Well, I just thought you'd want to know, said Coraline. Thank you, Coraline, said the other mother coldly, and her voice did not just come out from her mouth. It came from the mist and the fog and the house and the sky. She said, you know that I love you. And despite herself, Coraline nodded. It was true. The other mother loved her, but she loved Coraline as a miser loves money or a dragon loves its gold. In the other mother's button eyes, Coraline knew that she was a possession, nothing more. A tolerated pet whose behavior was no longer amusing. I don't want your love, said Coraline. I don't want anything from you. Not even a helping hand, asked the other mother. You've been doing so well, after all. I thought you might want a little hint to help you with the rest of your treasure hunt. I'm doing fine on my own, said Coraline. Yes, said the other mother, but if you wanted to get into the flat in the front, the empty one, to look around, you would find that the door was locked, and then where would you be? Oh, Coraline pondered this for a moment. Then she said, is there a key? The other mother stood there in the paper gray fog of the flattening world. Her black hair drifted about her head as if it had a mind and a purpose all of its own. She coughed suddenly in the back of her throat, and then she opened her mouth. The other mother reached up her hand and removed a small brass front door key from her tongue. Here, she said, you'll need this to get in. She tossed the key casually toward Coraline, who caught it, one-handed, before she could think about whether she wanted it or not. The key was still slightly damp. A chill wind blew about them, and Coraline shivered and looked away. When she looked back, she was alone. Uncertainly, she walked around to the front of the house and stood in front of the door to the empty flat. Like all the doors, it was painted bright green. She does not mean you well, whispered a ghost voice in her ear. We do not believe that she would help you. It must be a trick. Coraline said, yes, you're right, I expect. Then she put the key in the lock and turned it. Silently, the door swung open, and silently, Coraline walked inside. The flat had walls the color of old milk. The wooden boards on the floor were uncarpeted and dusty, with the marks and patterns of old carpets and rugs on them. There was no furniture in there, only places where furniture had once been. Nothing decorated the walls. There were discolored rectangles on the walls to show where paintings or photographs had once hung. It was so silent that Coraline imagined that she could hear the motes of dust drifting through the air. She found herself to be quite worried that something would jump out at her, so she began to whistle. She thought it might make it harder for things to jump out at her if she was whistling. First, she walked through the empty kitchen. Then, she walked through an empty bedroom, containing only a cast iron bath, and in the bath, a dead spider the size of a small cat. The last room she looked at had, she supposed, once been a bedroom. She could imagine that the rectangular dust shadow on the floorboards had once been a bed. Then she saw something and smiled grimly. Set into the floorboards was a large metal ring. Coraline knelt and took the cold ring into her hands and she tugged upward as hard as she could. Terribly, slowly, stiffly, heavily, a hinged square floor lifted. It was a trap door. It lifted and through the opening, Coraline could see only darkness. She reached down, and her hand found a cold switch. She flicked it without much hope that it would work. But somewhere below her, a ball lit, and a thin yellow light came up from the hole in the floor. She could see steps heading down, but nothing else. Coraline put her hand into her pocket and took out the stone with the hole in it. She looked through it at the cellar, but saw nothing. She put the stone back into her pocket. Up through the hole came the smell of damp clay, and something else, an acrid tang like sour vinegar. Coraline let herself down into the hole, looking nervously at the trap door. It was so heavy that if it fell, she was sure she would be trapped in the darkness forever. 
She put up a hand and touched it, but it stayed in position. And then she turned toward the darkness below, and she walked down the steps. Set into the wall at the bottom of the steps was, an, was another light switch, metal and rusting. She pushed it until it clicked down, and a naked bulb hanging from a wire from the low ceiling came on. It did not give up enough light even for Coraline to make out the things that had been painted onto the flaking cellar walls. The painting seemed crude. There were eyes, she could see that, and things that might have been grapes, and other things below them. Coraline could not be sure that they were paintings of people. There was a pile of rubbish in one corner of the room, cardboard boxes filled with mildewed papers, and decaying curtains in a heap beside them. Coraline's slippers crunched across the cement floor. The bad smell was worse now. She was ready to turn and leave when she saw the foot sticking out from beneath the pile of curtains. She took a deep breath. The smells of sour wine and moldy bread filled her head, and she pulled away the damp cloth to reveal something more or less the size and shape of a person. In that dim light, it took her several seconds to recognize it for what it was. The thing was pale and swollen like a grub, with thin, stick-like arms and feet. It had almost no features on its face, which had puffed and swollen like risen bread dough. The thing had two large black buttons where its eyes should have been. Coraline made a noise, a sound of revulsion and horror, and, as if it had heard her and awakened, the thing began to sit up. Coraline stood there, frozen. The thing turned its head until both its black button eyes were pointed straight at her. A mouth opened in the mouthless face, strands of pale stuff sticking to the lips, and a voice that no longer even faintly resembled her father's whispered, Coraline. Well, said Coraline to the thing that had once been her other father, at least you didn't jump out at me. The creature's twig-like hands moved to its face and pushed the pale clay about, making something like a nose. It said nothing. I'm looking for my parents, said Coraline, or a stolen soul from one of the other children. Are they down here? There is nothing down here, said the pale thing indistinctly. Nothing but dust and damp and forgetting. The thing was white and huge and swollen. Monstrous, thought Coraline, but also miserable. She raised the stone with the hole in it to her eye and looked through it. Nothing. The pale thing was telling her the truth. Poor thing, she said. I bet she made you come down here as a punishment for telling me too much. The thing hesitated, then it nodded. Coraline wondered how she could ever have imagined that this grub-like thing resembled her father. I'm so sorry, she said. She's not best pleased, said the thing that was once her father. Not best pleased at all. You've put her quite out of sorts, and when she gets out of sorts, she takes it out on everybody else. It's her way. Coraline patted its hairless head. Its skin was tacky, like warm bread dough. Poor thing, she said. You're just a thing she made and then threw away. The thing nodded vigorously. As it nodded, the left button eye fell off and clattered onto the concrete floor. The thing looked around vacantly with its one eye, as if it had lost her. Finally, it saw her, and, as if making a great effort, it opened its mouth once more and said in a wet, urgent voice, Run, child, leave this place. She wants me to hurt you, to keep you here forever, so that you can never finish the game, and she will win. She's pushing me so hard to hurt you, I cannot fight her. You can, said Coraline. Be brave. She looked around. The thing had once been the other that had once been the other father was between her and the steps up and out of the cellar. She started edging along the wall, heading toward the steps. The thing twisted bonelessly until its one eye was again facing her. It seemed to be getting bigger now and more awake. Alas, it said, I cannot. And it lunged across the cellar toward her then. Its toothless mouth opened wide. Coraline had a single heartbeat in which to react. She could only think of two things to do. Either she could scream and try to run away and be chased around a badly lit cellar by the huge grub thing, be chased until it caught her, or she could do something else. So she did something else. As the thing reached her, Coraline put out her hand and closed it around the thing's remaining button eye, and she tugged as hard as she knew how. For a moment, nothing happened. Then the button came away and flew from her hand, clicking against the walls before it fell to the cellar floor. The thing froze in place. It threw its pale head back blindly and opened its mouth horribly wide, and it roared its anger and frustration. Then, all in a rush, the thing swept toward the place where Coraline had been standing. But Coraline was not standing there anymore. <clears throat> she was already tiptoeing, as quietly as she could, up the steps that would take her away from the dim cellar with the crude paintings on the wall. She could not take her eyes from the floor beneath her, though, across which the pale thing flopped and writhed, hunting for her. Then, as if it was being told what to do, the creature stopped moving, and its blind head tipped to one side. It's listening for me, thought Coraline. I must be extra quiet. She took another step up, and her foot slipped on the step, and the thing heard her. 
its head tipped towards her. For a moment, it swayed and seemed to be gathering its wits. Then, fast as a serpent, it slithered for the steps and began to flow up them toward her. Coraline turned and ran wildly up the last half dozen steps, and she pushed, her, pushed herself up and onto the floor of the dusty bedroom. Without pausing, she pulled the heavy trap door toward her and let go of it. It crashed down with a thump just as something large banged against it. The trap door shook and rattled on the floor, but it stayed where it was. Coraline took a deep breath. If there had been any furniture in the flat, even a chair, she would have pulled it onto the trap door, but there was nothing. She walked out of the flat as fast as she could without actually ever running, and she locked the front door behind her. She left the door key under the mat. Then she walked down onto the drive. She had half expected that the other mother would be standing there waiting for Coraline to come out, but the world was silent and empty. Coraline wanted to go home. She hugged herself and told herself that she was brave, and she almost believed herself. And then she walked around to the side of the house in the gray mist that wasn't a mist, and she made for the stairs to go up. Chapter 10 Coraline walked up the stairs outside the building to the topmost flat, where, in her world, the crazy old man upstairs lived. She had gone up there once with her real mother, when her mother was collecting for charity. They had stood in the open doorway, waiting for the crazy old man with the big mustache to find the envelope that Coraline's mother had left, and the flat had smelled of strange foods and pipe tobacco and odd, sharp, cheesy-smelling things Coraline could not name. She had not wanted to go any farther inside than that. I'm an explorer, said Coraline out loud, but her words sounded muffled and dead on the misty air. She had made it out of the cellar, hadn't she? And she had. But if there was one thing that Coraline was certain of, it was that this flat would be worse. She reached the top of the house. The topmost flat had once been the attic of the house, but that was long ago. She knocked on the green, painted door. It swung open, and she walked in. We have eyes and we have nerves. We have tails, we have teeth. You'll all get what you deserve when we've risen from underneath, whispered a dozen or more tiny voices in that dark flat with the roof so low where it met the walls that Coraline could almost reach up and touch it. Red eyes stared at her. Little pink feet scurried away as she came close. Darker shadows slipped through the shadows at the edges of things. It smelled much worse in here than in the real crazy old man's upstairs flat. That smelled of food, unpleasant food, to Coraline's mind, but she knew that was a matter of taste. She did not like spices, herbs, or exotic things. This place smelled as if all the exotic foods in the world had been left out to go rotten. Little girl, said a rustling voice in a far room. Yes, said Coraline. I'm not frightened, she told herself, and as she thought it, she knew that it was true. There was nothing here that frightened her. These things, even the thing in the cellar, were illusions, things made by the other mother in a ghastly parody of the real people and real things on the other end of the corridor. She could not truly make anything, decided Coraline. She could only twist and copy and distort things that already existed. And then Coraline found herself wondering why the other mother would have placed a snow globe on the drawing room mantelpiece. For the mantelpiece in Coraline's world was quite bare. As soon as she asked herself the question, she re realized that there was actually an answer. Then the voice came again and her train of thought was interrupted. Come here, little girl. I know what you want, little girl. It was a rustling voice, scratchy and dry. It made Coraline think of some kind of enormous dead insect, which was silly, she knew. How could a dead thing, especially a dead insect, have a voice? She walked through several rooms with low, slanting ceilings until she came to the final room. It was a bedroom, and the other crazy old man upstairs sat at the far end of the room in the near darkness, bundled up in his coat and hat. As Coraline entered, he began to talk. Nothing's changed, little girl, he said, his voice sounding like the noise dry leaves make as they rustle across a pavement. And what if you do everything you swore you would? What then? Nothing's changed. You'll go home. You'll be bored. You'll be ignored. No one will listen to you. Not really listen to you. You're too clever and too quiet for them to understand. They don't even get your name right. Stay here with us, said the voice from the figure at the end of the room. We will listen to you and play with you and laugh with you. Your other mother will build whole worlds for you to explore and tear them down every night when you are done. Every day will be better and brighter than the one that went before. Remember the toy box? How much better would a world be built just like that and all for you? And will there be gray, wet days where I just don't know what to do and there's nothing to read or to watch and nowhere to go and the day drags on forever, asked Coraline? From the shadows, the man said, never. And will there be awful meals with food made from recipes with garlic and tarragon and broad beans in it, asked Coraline. Every meal will be a thing of joy, whispered the voice from under the old man's hat. Nothing will pass your lips that does not entirely delight you. 
And could I have day glow green gloves to wear and yellow Wellington boots in the shape of frogs? asked Coraline. Frogs, ducks, rhinos, octopuses, whatever you desire. The world will be built new for you every morning. If you stay here, you can have whatever you want. Coraline sighed. You really don't understand, do you? She said. I don't want whatever I want. Nobody does. Not really. What kind of fun would it be if I just got everything I ever wanted? Just like that, and it didn't mean anything. What then? I don't understand, said the whispery voice. Of course you don't understand, she said, raising the stone with the hole in it to her eye. You're just a bad copy she made of the crazy old man upstairs. Not even that anymore, said the dead, whispery voice. There was a glow coming from the raincoat of the man, at about chest height. Through the hole in the stone, the glow twinkled and shone, blue white as any star. She wished she had a stick or something to poke him with. She had no wish to get any closer to the shadowy man at the end of the room. Coraline took a step closer to the man, and he fell apart. Black rats leapt from the sleeves and from under the coat and hat, a score or more of them, red eyes shining in the dark. They chittered and they fled. The coat fluttered and fell heavily to the floor. The hat rolled into one corner of the room. Coraline reached out one hand and pulled the coat open. It was empty, although it was greasy to the touch. There was no sign of the final glass marble in it. She scanned the room, squinting through the hole in the stone, and caught sight of something that twinkled and burned like a star at floor level by the doorway. It was being carried in the forepaws of the largest black rat. As she looked, it slipped away. The other rats watched her from the corners of the room as she ran after it. Now, rats can run faster than people, especially over short distances, but a large black rat holding a marble in its two front paws is no match for the determined girl, even if she is small for her age, moving at a run. Smaller black rats ran back and forth across her path, trying to distract her, but she ignored them all, keeping her eyes fixed on the one with the marble, who was heading straight out of the flat toward the front door. They reached the steps on the outside of the building. Coraline had time to observe that the house itself was continuing to change, becoming less distinct and flattening out, even as she raced down the stairs. It reminded her of a photograph of a house now, not the thing itself. Then she was simply racing pell-mell down the steps in pursuit of the rat, with no room in her mind for anything else certain she was gaining on it. She was running fast, too fast, she discovered, as she came to the bottom of one flight of stairs and her foot skidded and twisted and she went crashing onto the concrete landing. Her left knee was scraped and skinned and the palm of one hand she had thrown out to stop herself was a mess of scaped, scraped skin and grit. It hurt a little and it would, she knew, soon hurt much more. She picked the grit out of her palm and climbed to her feet as fast as she could, Knowing that she had lost and it was already too late, she went down to the final landing at the ground level. She looked around for the rat, but it was gone, and the marble with it. Her hand stung where the skin had been scraped, and there was blood trickling down her ripped pajama leg from her knee. It was as bad as the summer that her mother had taken the training wheels off of Coraline's bicycle. But then, back then, in with all the cuts and scrapes, her knees had scabs on top of scabs. She had had a feeling of achievement. She was learning something, doing something she had not known how to do. Now she felt nothing but cold loss. She had failed the ghost children, she had failed her parents, and she had failed herself. Failed everything. She closed her eyes and wished that the earth would swallow her up, but there was a cough. She opened her eyes and saw the rat. It was lying on the brick path at the bottom of the stairs with a surprised look on its face, which was now several inches away from the rest of it. Its whiskers were stiff, its eyes were wide open, its teeth visible and yellow and sharp. A collar of wet blood glistened at its neck. Beside the decapitated rat, a smug expression on its face, was the black cat. It rested one paw on the gray glass marble. I think I once mentioned, said the cat, that I don't like rats at the best of times. It looked like you needed this one, however. I hope you don't mind my getting involved. I think, said Coraline, trying to catch her breath, I think you may have said something out of sort. The cat lifted its paw from the, from the marble, which rolled towards Coraline. She picked it up. In her mind, a final voice whispered to her urgently. She has lied to you. She will never give you up. Now she has you. She will no more give any of us up than change her nature. The hairs on the back of Coraline's neck prickled, and Coraline knew that the girl's voice told the truth. She put the marble in her dressing gown pocket with the others. She had all three marbles now. All she needed to do was to find her parents. And, Coraline realized with surprise, that bit was easy. She knew exactly where her parents were. If she had stopped to think, she might have known where they were all along. The other mother could not create. She could only transform and twist and change. The mantelpiece in the drawing room back home was quite empty, but knowing that, she knew something else as well. 
The other mother, she plans to break her promise. She won't let us go, said Coraline. I wouldn't put it past her, admitted the cat. Like I said, there's no guarantee she'll play fair. And then he raised his head. Hello? Did you see that? What? Look behind you, said the cat. The house had flattened out even more. It no longer looked like a photograph, more like a drawing. A crude, charcoal scribble of a house drawn on gray paper. Whatever's happening, said Coraline. Thank you for helping with the rat. I suppose I'm almost there, aren't I? So you go off into the mist, or wherever you go, and I'll, well, I hope I get to see you at home, if she lets me go home. The cat's fur was on end, and its tail was bristling like a chimney sweet brush. What's wrong? said Coraline. They've gone, said the cat. They aren't there anymore. The way's in and out of this place. They just went flat. Is that bad? The cat lowered its tail, swishing it from side to side angrily. It made a low, growling noise in the back of its throat. It walked in a circle until it was facing away from Coraline, and then it began to walk backwards stiffly, one step at a time, until it was pushing up against Coraline's leg. She put down a hand to stroke it and could feel how hard its heart was beating. It was trembling like a dead leaf in a storm. You'll be fine, said Coraline. Everything's going to be fine. I'll take you home. The cat said nothing. Come on, cat, said Coraline. She took a step back towards the steps, but the cat stayed where it was, looking miserable and, oddly, much smaller. If the only way out is past her, said Coraline, then that's the way we're going to go. She went back to the cat, bent down, and picked it up. The cat did not resist. It simply trembled. She supported its bottom with one hand, rested its front legs on her shoulders. The cat was heavy, but not too heavy to carry. It looked at the palm of her hand, where the blood from the scrape was welling up. Coraline walked up the stairs one step at a time, heading back to her own flat. She was aware of the marbles clicking in her pocket, aware of the stone with a hole in it, aware of the cat pressing itself against her. She got to the front door, now just a small child scrawl of a door, and she pushed her hand against it, half expecting that her hand would rip through it, revealing nothing but its blackness and a scattering of stars. But the door swung open, and Coraline went through. Chapter 11 Once inside her flat, or rather, in the flat that was not hers, Coraline was pleased to see that it had not transformed into the empty drawing that the rest of the house seemed to have become. It had depth, and shadows, and someone who stood in the shadows waiting for Coraline to return. So you're back, said the other mother. She did not sound pleased. And you brought vermin with you. No, said Coraline. I brought a friend. She could feel the cat sniffing it, stiffening under her hands as if it were anxious to be away. Coraline wanted to hold on to it like a teddy bear, for reassurance, but she knew that cats hate to be squeezed, and she suspected that frightened cats were liable to bite and scratch if provoked in any way, even if they were on your side. You know I love you, said the other mother flatly. You have a very funny way of showing it, said Coraline. She walked down the hallway, then turned into the drawing room, steady step by step, pretending that she could not feel the other mother's blank black eyes on her back. Her grandmother's formal furniture was still there, and the painting on the wall of the strange fruit, but now the fruit in the painting had been eaten, and all that remained in the bowl was the browning core of an apple, several plum and peach stones, and the stem of what had formerly been a bunch of grapes. The lion pawed table raked the carpet with its clawed wooden feet as if it were impatient for something. At the end of the room, in the corner, stood the wooden door, which had once, in another place, opened onto a plain brick wall. Coraline tried not to stare at it. The window showed nothing but mist. This was it, Coraline knew, the moment of truth, the unraveling time. The other mother had followed her in. Now she stood in the center of the room, between Coraline and the mantelpiece, and looked down at Coraline with black button eyes. It was funny, Coraline thought. The other mother did not look anything at all like her own mother. She wondered how she had ever been deceived into imagining a resemblance. The other mother was huge. Her head almost brushed the ceiling, and very pale, the color of a spider's belly. Her hair writhed and twined about her head, and her teeth were sharp as knives. Well, said the other mother sharply, where are they? Coraline leaned against an armchair, adjusted the cat with her left hand, put her right hand into her pocket, and pulled out the three glass marbles. They were frosted gray, and they clinked together in the palm of her hand. The other mother reached her white fingers for them, but Coraline slipped them back into her pocket. She knew it was true, then. The other mother had no intention of letting her go or of keeping her word. It had been an entertainment and nothing more. Hold on, she said. We aren't finished yet, are we? The other mother looked daggers, but she smiled sweetly. No, she said. I suppose not. After all, you still need to find your parents, don't you? Yes, said Coraline thought. I must not look at the mantelpiece, she thought. I must not even think about it. Well, said the other mother, produce them. Would you like to look in the cellar again? I have some other interesting things hidden down there, you know. 
No, said Coraline. I know where my parents are. The cat was heavy in her arms. She moved it forward, unhooking its claws from her shoulder as she did so. Where? It stands to reason, said Coraline. I've looked everywhere you'd hide them. They aren't in the house. The other mother stood very still, giving nothing away, lips tightly closed. She might have been a wax statue. Even her hair had stopped moving. So, Coraline continued, both hands wrapped firmly around the black cat. I know where they have to be. You've hidden them in the passageway between the houses, haven't you? They are behind that door. She nodded her head towards the door in the corner. The other mother remained statue still, but a hint of a smile crept back onto her face. Oh, they are, are they? Why don't you open it, said Coraline. They'll be there, all right. It was her only way home, she knew, but it all depended on the other mother's needing to gloat, needing not only to win, but to show that she had won. The other mother reached her hand slowly into her apron pocket and produced the black iron key. The cat stirred uncomfortably in Coraline's arms, as if it wanted to get down. Just stay there for a few moments longer, she thought at it, wondering if it could hear her. I'll get us both home. I said I would. I promise. She felt the cat relax ever so slightly in her arms. The other mother walked over to the door and pushed the key into the lock. She turned the key. Coraline heard the mechanism clunk heavily. She was already starting, as quietly as she could, step by step, to back away toward the mantelpiece. The other mother pushed down on the door handle and pulled open the door, revealing a corridor behind it, dark and empty. There, she said, waving her hands at the corridor. The expression of delight on her face was a very bad thing to see. You're wrong. You don't know where your parents are, do you? They aren't there. She turned and looked at Coraline. Now, she said, you're going to stay here forever and always. No, said Coraline, I'm not. And hard as she could, she threw the black cat toward the other mother. It yowled and landed on the other mother's head, clawing, claws flailing, teeth bared, fierce and angry. For on end, it looked half again as big as it was in real life. Without waiting to see what would happen, Coraline reached up to the mantelpiece and closed her hand around the snow globe, pushing it deep into the pocket of her dressing gown. The cat made a deep, yulating howl and sank its teeth into the other mother's cheek. She was flailing at it. Blood ran from the cuts on her white face. Not red blood, but a deep, tarry black stuff. Coraline ran for the door. She pulled the key out of the lock. Leave her. Come on, she shouted to the cat. It hissed and swiped its scalp scalpel-sharp claws at the other mother's face in one wild rake, which left black ooze trickling from several gashes on the other mother's nose. Then it sprang towards Coraline, Quickly, she said. The cat ran towards her, and they both stepped into the dark corridor. It was colder in the corridor, like stepping down into a cellar on a warm day. The cat hesitated for a moment. Then, seeing the other mother was coming toward them, it ran to Coraline and stopped by her legs. Coraline began to pull the door closed. It was heavier than she imagined a door could be, and pulling it closed was like trying to close a door against a high wind. Then she felt something from the other side starting to pull against her. Shut, she thought. Then she said out loud, Come on, please, and she felt the door begin to move, to pull closed, to give against the phantom wind. Suddenly, she was aware of the other people in the corridor with her. She could not turn her head to look at them, but she knew them without having to look. Help me, please, she said, all of you. The other people in the corridor, three children, two adults, were somehow too insubstantial to touch the door. But their hands closed about hers as she pulled on the big iron door handle, and suddenly she felt strong. Never let up, miss. Hold strong, hold strong, whispered a voice in her mind. Pull, girl, pull, whispered another. And then a voice that sounded like her mother's, her own mother, her real, wonderful, maddening, infuriating, glorious mother, just said, Well done, Coraline. And that was enough. The door started to slip closed, easily as anything. No, screamed a voice from behind the door, and it no longer sounded even faintly human. Something snatched at Coraline, reaching through the closing gap between the door and the doorpost. Coraline jerked her head out of the way, but the door began to open once more. We're going home, said Coraline. We are. Help me. She ducked the snatching fingers. They moved through her then. Ghost hands lent her strength that she no longer possessed. There was a final moment of resistance, as if something were caught in the door. And then, with a crash, the wooden door banged closed. Something dropped from Coraline's head height to the floor. It landed with a sort of scuttling thump. Come on, said the cat. This is not a good place to be in. Quickly. Coraline turned her back on the door and began to run, as fast as was practical, through the dark corridor, running her hand along the wall to make sure she didn't bump into anything or get turned around in the darkness. 
It was an uphill run, and it seemed to her that it went on for a longer distance than anything could possibly go. The wall she was touching felt warm and yielding now, and she realized it felt as if it were covered in a fine downy fur. It moved, as if it were taking a breath. She snatched her hand away from it. Winds howled in the dark. She was scared she would bump into something, and she would put her, out her hand for the wall once more. This time, what she touched felt hot and wet, as if she had put her hand in somebody's mouth, and she pulled it back with a small wail. Her eyes adjusted to the dark. She could half see, as faintly glowing patches ahead of her, two adults, three children. She could hear the cat, too, patting in the dark in front of her. And there was something else, which suddenly scuttled between her feet, nearly sending Coraline flying. She caught herself before she went down, using her own momentum to keep moving. She knew that if she fell in the corridor, she might never get up again. Whatever that corridor was, was older by far than the other mother. It was deep and slow, and it knew that she was there. Then, daylight appeared, and she ran toward it, puffing and wheezing. Almost there, she called encouragingly, but in the light, she discovered that the wraiths had gone, and she was alone. She did not have time to wonder what had happened to them. Panting for breath, she staggered through the door and slammed it behind her with the loudest, most satisfying bang that you can imagine. Coraline locked the door with the key and put the key back into her pocket. The black cat was huddled in the farthest corner of the room, the pink tip of its tongue showing, its eyes wide. Coraline went over to it and crouched down beside it. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry I threw you at her. It was the only way to distract her enough to get us all out. She would never have kept her word, would she? The cat looked up at her, then rested its head on her hand, licking her fingers with its sandpapery tongue. It began to purr. Then we're friends, said Coraline. She sat down in one of her grandmother's uncomfortable armchairs, and the cat sprang up into her lap and made itself comfortable. The light that came through the picture window was daylight. Real, golden, late afternoon daylight, not a white mist light. The sky was a robin's egg blue, and Coraline could see trees, and beyond the, green, uh, beyond the trees, green hills, which faded on the horizon into purples and grays. The sky had never seemed so sky. The world had never seemed so world. Coraline stared at the leaves on the trees and the patterns of light and shadow on the cracked bark of the trunk of the, tree, of the beech tree outside the window. Then she looked down at her lap at the way the rich sunlight brushed every hair on the cat's head, turning each white whisker to gold. Nothing, she thought, had ever been so interesting. And, caught up in the interestingness of the world, Coraline barely noticed that she had wriggled down and curled cat-like on her grandmother's uncomfortable armchair, nor did she notice when she fell into a deep and dreamless sleep. Chapter 12 Her mother shook her gently awake. Coraline, she said, Darling, what a funny place to fall asleep. And really, this room is only for best. We looked all over the house for you. Coraline stretched and blinked. I'm sorry, she said. I fell asleep. I can see that, said her mother. And wherever did the cat come from? He was waiting by the front door when I came in, shot out like a bullet as I opened it. Probably had things to do, said Coraline. Then she hugged her mother so tightly that her arms began to ache. Her mother hugged Coraline back. Dinner in 15 minutes, said her mother. Don't forget to wash your hands. And just look at those pajama bottoms. What did you do to your poor knee? I tripped, said Coraline. She went to the bathroom and she washed her hands and cleaned her buddy, bloody knee. She put ointment on her cuts and scrapes. She went to her bedroom, her real bedroom, her true bedroom. She pushed her hands into the pockets of her dressing gown and she pulled out three marbles, a stone with a hole in it, the black key, and an empty snow globe. She shook the snow globe and watched the glittery snow swirl through the water to the, fill the empty world. She put it down and watched the snow fall, covering the place where the little couple had once stood. Coraline took a piece of string from her toy box and she strung the black key on the string. Then she knotted the string and hung it around her neck. There, she said. She put on some clothes and hid the key under her t-shirt. It was cold against her skin. The stone went into her pocket. Coraline walked down the hallway to her father's study. He had his back to her, but she knew, just on seeing him, that his eyes, when he turned around, would be her father's kind gray eyes. And she crept over and kissed him on the back of his balding head. Hello, Coraline, he said. Then he looked around and smiled at her. What was that for? Nothing, said Coraline. I just miss you sometimes. That's all. Oh, good, he said. He put the computer to sleep, stood up, and then, for no reason at all, he picked Coraline up, which he had not done for such a long time. Not since he started pointing out to her she was much too old to be carried, and he carried her into the kitchen. Dinner that night was pizza, and even though it was homemade by her father, so the crust was alternately thick and doughy and raw, or too thin and burnt, and even though he put slices of green pepper on it, along with little meatballs and, of all things, pineapple chunks, Coraline ate the entire slice she had been given. 
Well, she ate everything except for the pineapple chunks. And soon enough, it was bedtime. Coraline kept the key around her neck, but she put the gray marbles beneath her pillow, and in bed that night, Coraline dreamed a dream. She was at a picnic under an old oak tree in a green meadow. The sun was high in the sky, and while there were distant, fluffy white clouds on the horizon, the sky above her head was a deep, untroubled blue. The, there was a white linen cloth laid on the grass with bowls piled high with food. She could see salads and sandwiches, nuts and fruit, jugs of lemonade and water, and thick chocolate milk. Coraline sat on one side of the tablecloth while three other children took a side each. They were dressed in the oddest clothes. The smallest of them, sitting on Coraline's left, was a boy with a dirty face. He put out his hand and held Coraline's hand with his own. It was warm now. It's a very fine thing you did for us, miss, said the tall girl. She now had a smear of chocolate ice cream all around her lips. I'm just pleased it's all over, said Coraline. Was it her imagination, or did a shadow cross the faces of the other children at the picnic? The wind girl, the circlet in her hair glittering like a star, rested her fingers for a moment on the back of Coraline's hand. It is over and done with, for us, she said. This is our staging post. From here, we three will set out for uncharted lands, and what comes after, no one alive can say. She stopped talking. There's a but, isn't there, said Coraline. I can feel it, like a rain cloud. The boy on her left tried to smile bravely, but his lower lip began to trum tremble, and he bit it with his upper teeth and said nothing. The girl in the brown bonnet shifted uncomfortably and said, Yes, miss. But I got you three back, said Coraline. I got mom and dad back. I shut the door. I locked it. What more was I meant to do? The boy squeezed Coraline's hand with his. She found herself remembering when it had been she, trying to reassure him, when he was little more than a cold memory in the darkness. Well, can't you give me a clue? asked Coraline. Isn't there something you can tell me? The beldam swore by her good right hand, said the tall girl, but she lied. My, my governess, said the boy used to say that nobody's ever given more to shoulder than he or she can bear. He shrugged as he said this, as if he had not yet made his own mind up whether or not it was true. We wish you luck, said the winged girl. Good fortune and wisdom and courage, although you have already shown that you have all three of these blessings, and in abundance. She hates you, blurted out the boy. She hasn't lost anything for so long. Be wise, be brave, be tricky. But it's not fair, said Coraline in her dream angrily. It's just not fair. It should be over. The boy with the dirty face stood up and hugged Coraline tightly. Tank up for in this, he whispered. Thou art alive, thou livest. And in her dream, Coraline saw the sun had set and the stars were twinkling in the darkening sky. Coraline stood in the meadow and she watched as the three children, two of them walking and one flying, went away from her across the grass, silver in the light of the huge moon. The three of them came to a small wooden bridge over a stream. They stopped there and turned and waved, and Coraline waved back. And what came after was darkness. Coraline woke in the early hours of the morning, convinced she had heard something moving, but unsure what it was. She waited. Something made a rustling noise outside her bedroom door. She wondered if it was a rat. The door rattled. Coraline clambered out of bed. Go away, said Coraline sharply. Go away or you'll be sorry. There was a pause. Then whatever it was scuttled away down the hall. There was something odd and irregular about his footsteps, if they were footsteps. Coraline found herself wondering if it was perhaps a rat with an extra leg. It isn't over, is it, she said to herself. Then she opened the bedroom door. The gray, pre-dawn light showed her the whole of the corridor, completely deserted. She went toward the front door, sparing a hasty glance back at the wardrobe door mirror hanging on the wall at the other end of the hallway, seeing nothing but her own pale face staring back at her, looking sleepy and serious. Gentle, reassuring snores came from her parents' room, but the door was closed. All the doors of the corridor were closed. Whatever the scuttling thing was, it had to be here somewhere. Coraline opened the front door and looked at the gray sky. She wondered how long it would be until the sun came up, wondered whether her dream had been a true thing while knowing in her heart that it had been. Something she had taken to be a part of the shadows under the hall couch detached itself from beneath the couch and made a mad, scrabbling rush on its long, white legs, heading for the front door. Coraline's mouth dropped open in horror, and she stepped out of the way as the thing clicked and scuttled past her out of the house, running crab-like on its too many tapping, clicking, scurrying feet. She knew what it was, and she knew what it was after. She had seen it too many times in the last few days, reaching and clutching and snatching and popping black beetles obediently into the other mother's mouth. Five-footed, crimson-nailed, the color of bone. It was the other mother's right hand. It wanted the black key.
Chapter 13. Coraline's parents never seemed to remember anything about their time in the snow globe. At least, they never said anything about it, and Coraline never mentioned it to them. Sometimes she wondered whether they had ever noticed that they had lost two days in the real world, and came to the eventual conclusion that they had not. Then again, there are some people who keep track of every day and every hour, and there are people who don't, and Coraline's parents were solidly in the second camp. Coraline had placed the marbles beneath her pillow before she went to sleep that first night home in her own room once more. She went back to bed after she saw the other mother's hand, although there was not much time left for sleeping, and she rested her head back on the pillow. Something scrunched gently as she did. She sat up and lifted the pillow. The fragments of the glass marbles that she saw looked like the remains of eggshells one finds beneath the trees in the springtime, like empty, broken robin's eggs, or even more delicate, wren's eggs, perhaps. Whatever had been inside the glass spheres had gone. Coraline thought of the three children waving goodbye to her in the moonlight, waving before they crossed that silver stream. She gathered up the eggshell-thin fragments with care and placed them in a small blue box which had once held a bracelet that her grandmother had given her when she was a little girl. The brace bracelet was long lost, but the box remained. Miss Spink and Miss Forcible came back from visiting Miss Spink's niece, and Coraline went down to their flat for tea. It was a Monday. On Wednesday, Coraline would go back to school. A whole new school year would begin. Miss Forcible insisted on reading Coraline's tea leaves. Well, looks like everything's mostly ship shape in Bristol fashion, lovey, said Miss Forcible. Sorry, said Coraline. Everything is coming up roses, said Miss Forcible. Well, almost everything. I'm not sure what that is. She pointed to a clump of tea leaves sticking to the side of the cup. Miss Spink tutted and reached for the cup. Honestly, Miriam, give it over here. Let me see. She blinked through her thick spectacles. Oh, dear. No, I have no idea what that signifies. It looks almost like a hand. Coraline looked. The clump of leaves did look a little like a hand, reaching for something. Hamish, the Scotty dog, was hiding under Miss Forcible's chair, and he wouldn't come out. I think he was in some sort of fight, said Miss Spink. He has a deep gash in his side, poor dear. We'll take him to the vet later this afternoon. I wish I knew what could have done it. Something, Coraline knew, would have to be done. That final week of the holidays, the weather was magnificent, as if the summer itself were trying to make up for the miserable weather they had been having by giving them some bright and glorious days before it ended. The crazy old man upstairs called down to Coraline when he saw her coming out to coming out of Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's flat. Hey, hi, you, Caroline. He shouted over the railing. It's Coraline, she said. How are the mice? Something has frightened them, said the old man, scratching his mustache. I think maybe there's a weasel in the house. Something is about. I heard it in the night. In my country, we would have put down a trap for it, maybe put down a little meat or hamburger, and when the creature comes to feast, then bam, it would be caught and never bother us anymore. The mice are so scared they will not even pick up their little musical instruments. I don't think it wants me, said Coraline. She put her hand up and touched the black key that hung around her neck. Then she went inside. She bathed herself and kept the key around her neck the whole time she was in the bath. She never took it off anymore. Something scratched at her bedroom window after she went to bed. Coraline was almost asleep, but she slipped out of her bed and pulled open the curtains. A white hand with crimson fingernails leapt from the window ledge onto a drain pipe and was immediately out of sight. There were deep gouges in the glass on the other side of the window. Coraline slept uneasily that night, waking from time to time to plot and plan and ponder, then falling back into sleep, never quite certain where her pondering ended and the dream began, one ear always open for the sound of something scratching at her window pane or at her bedroom door. In the morning, Coraline said to her mother, I'm going to have a picnic with my dolls today. Can I borrow a sheet? An old one? One you don't need any longer? I don't think we have one of those, said her mother. She opened the kitchen drawer that held the napkins and the tablecloths, and she prodded about in it. Hold on. Will this do? It was a folded-up disposable tablecloth covered with red flowers left over from some picnic they had been on several years before. That's perfect, said Coraline. I didn't think you played with your dolls anymore, said Mrs. Jones. I don't, admitted Coraline. They're protective coloration. Well, be back in time for lunch, said her mother. Have a good time. Coraline filled the cardboard box with dolls and with several plastic doll teacups. She filled a jug with water. Then she went outside. She walked down to the road, just as if she were going to the shops. Before she reached the supermarket, she cut across the fence into some wasteland and along an old drive, then crawled under a hedge. She had to go under the hedge in two journeys in order not to spill the water from the jug. It was a long, roundabout, looping journey, but at the end of it, Coraline was satisfied that she had not been followed. She came out behind the dilapidated old tennis court. She crossed over it to the meadow where the long grass swayed. She found the planks on the edge of the meadow. They were astonishingly heavy, almost too heavy for a girl to lift, even using all her strength, but she managed. 
She didn't have any choice. She pulled the planks out of the way, one by one, grunting and sweating with effort, revealing a deep, round, brick-lined hole in the ground. It smelled of damp and the dark. The bricks were greenish and slippery. She spread out the tablecloth and laid it, carefully over the top of the well. She put a plastic doll's cup every foot or so at the edge of the well, and she weighed each cup down with the water from the jug. She put a doll in the grass beside each cup, making it look as much like a doll's tea party as she could. Then she retraced her steps back under the hedge along the dusty yellow drive around the back of the shops back to her house. She reached up and took the key from around her neck. She dangled it from the string as if the key were just something she liked to play with. Then she knocked on the door of Miss Spink and Miss Worsbow's flat. Miss Spink opened the door. Hello, dear, she said. I don't want to come in, said Coraline. I just wanted to find out how Hamish was doing. Miss Spink sighed. Well, the vet says the Hamish is a brave little soldier, she said. Luckily, the cut doesn't seem to be infected. We cannot imagine what could have done it. The vet says some animal, he thinks, but has no idea what. Mr. Bobo says he thinks it might have been a weasel. Mr. Bobo? The man in the top flat. Mr. Bobo. Fine old circus family, I believe. Romanian or Slovenian or Livonian or one of those countries. Bless me, I can never remember them anymore. It had never occurred to Coraline that the crazy old man upstairs actually had a name, she realized. If she'd known his name was Mr. Bobo, she would have said it every chance she got. How often do you get to say a name like Mr. Bobo aloud? Oh, said Coraline to Miss Spink. Mr. Bobo, right. Well, she said a little louder, I'm going to go and play with my new dolls now, over by the old tennis court round the back. That's nice, dear, said Miss Spink. Then she added confidentially, make sure you keep an eye out for the old well. Mr. Lovett, who was here before your time, said that he thought it might go down for half a mile or more. Coraline hopped, hoped that the hand had not heard this last, and she changed the subject. This key? said Coraline loudly. Oh, it's just an old key from our house. It's part of my game. That's why I'm carrying it around with me on this piece of string. Well, goodbye now. What an extraordinary child, said Miss Spink to herself as she closed the door. Coraline ambled across the meadow toward the old tennis court, dangling and swinging the black key on its piece of string as she walked. Several times she thought she saw something the color of bone in the undergrowth. It was keeping pace with her, wandered through the woods, and her voice hardly trembled at all. The doll's tea party was where she had left it. She was relieved that it was not a windy day, for everything was still in its place. Every water-filled plastic cup weighed down the paper tablecloth as it was meant to. She breathed a sigh of relief. Now was the hardest part. Hello, doll, she said brightly. It's tea time. She walked close to the paper tablecloth. I brought the lucky key, she told the dolls, to make sure that we have a good picnic. And then, as carefully as she could, she leaned over and gently placed the key on the tablecloth. She was still holding onto the string. She held her breath, hoping that the cup of water at the edge of the well would weigh the cloth down, letting it take the weight of the key without collapsing into the well. The key sat in the middle of the paper picnic cloth. Coraline let go of the string and took a step back. Now it was all up to the hand. She turned to the dolls. Who would like a piece of cherry cake? She asked. Jemima? Pinky? What about Primrose? and she served each doll a slice of invisible cake on an invisible plate, chattering happily as she did so. From the corner of her eye, she saw something bone-white scamper from one tree trunk to another, closer and closer. She forced herself not to look at it. Jemima, said Coraline, what a bad girl you are. You've dropped your cake. Now I'll have to go over and get you a whole new slice. And she walked around the tea party until she was on the other side of it to the hand. She pretended to clean up the spilled cake and to get Jemima another piece, and then... In a skittering, chittering rush, it came. The hand, running high on its fingertips, scrabbled through the tall grass and up onto a tree stump. It stood there for a moment, like a crab tasting the air, and then it made one triumphant, nail-clacking leap onto the center of the paper tablecloth. Time slowed for Coraline. The white fingers closed around the black key, and then the weight and the momentum of the hand sent the plastic doll's cups flying, and the paper tablecloth, the key, and the other mother's right hand went tumbling down into the darkness of the well. Coraline counted slowly under her breath. She got up to 40 before she heard a muffled splash coming from a long way below. Someone had once told her that if you look up at the sky from the bottom of a mine shaft, even in the brightest daylight, you see a night sky and stars. Coraline wondered if the hand could see stars from where it was. She hauled the heavy planks back under the well, covering it as carefully as she could. She didn't want anything to fall in, and she didn't want anything ever to get out. Then she put her dolls and the cups back in the cardboard box she had carried them out in. Something caught her eye while she was doing this, and she straightened up in time to see the black cat stalking toward her, its tail head held high and curling at the tip like a question mark. It was the first time she had seen the cat in several days since they had returned together from the other mother's place. 
The cat walked over to her and jumped onto the planks that covered the well. Then, slowly, it winked one eye at her. It sprang down into the long grass in front of her and rolled over on its back, wiggling about ecstatically. Coraline scratched and tickled the soft fur on its belly, and the cat purred contently. When it had had enough, it rolled over onto its front once more and walked back towards the tennis court like a tiny patch of midnight in the midday sun. Coraline went back to the house. Mr. Bobo was waiting for her in the driveway. He clapped her on the shoulder. The mice tell me that all is good, he said. They say that you are a savior, Caroline. It's Coraline, Mr. Bobo, said Coraline. Not Caroline, Coraline. Coraline, said Mr. Bobo, repeating her name to himself with wonderment and respect. Very good, Coraline. The mice say that I must tell you that as soon as they are ready to perform in public, you will come up and watch them as the first audience of all. They will play Tumpty Umpty and Toodle Oodle, and they will dance and do a thousand tricks. That is what they say. I would like that very much, said Coraline, when they're ready. She knocked at Miss Spink and Miss Forcible's door. Miss Spink let her in, and Coraline went into their parlor. She put her box of dolls down on the floor, then she put her hand into her pocket and pulled out the stone with a hole in it. Here you go, she said. I don't need it anymore. I'm very grateful. I think it may have saved my life and saved some other people's death. She gave them both tight hugs, although her arms barely stretched around Miss Spink and Miss Forcible. <laughs> then Coraline picked up her box of dolls and went out. What an extraordinary child, said Miss Spink. No one had hugged her like that since she had retired from the theater. That night, Coraline lay in bed, all bathed, teeth cleaned, with her eyes open, staring up at the ceiling. It was warm enough that, now that the hand was gone, she had opened the bedroom window wide. She insisted to her father that the curtains not be entirely closed. Her new school clothes were laid out carefully on her chair for her to put on when she woke. Normally, on the night before the first day of term, Coraline was apprehensive and nervous, but she realized there was nothing left about school that could scare her anymore. She fancied she could hear sweet music on the night air, the kind of music that could only be played on the tiniest silver trombones and trumpets and bassoons on piccolos and tubas so delicate and small that the keys could only be pressed by the tiny pink fingers of white mice. Coraline imagined that she was back again in her dream, with the two girls and the boy under the oak tree in the meadow, and she smiled. As the first stars came out, Coraline finally allowed herself to drift into sleep, while the gentle upstairs music of the mouse circus spilled out onto the warm evening air, telling the world that the summer was almost done. The end.